Are we on? I'm struggling to see. Yes, we are. Okay. I don't know if it's only me, but there is no audio of this video. Huh? Same, I cannot hear it. No, no, there's no.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the 2024 Interconnected Webinar Series. I uh, wish we focus on climate, environment, governance prompted by the Police Center. We are happy you are joining us from around the world and thank you for your presence. My name is Afi Malungu. I am the Africa Outreach Program Manager at the Police Center and I am based in Kinshasa in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I am the moderator of this session. Before we start, please note that we have live translation in Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Bahasa. You can select your preferred language by clicking on the globe symbol at the bottom of the right, uh, at the bottom right of the screen. And please select the Q&A button to leave your questions. So um, the Police Center's mission uh, to champion the power of stories to make complex issues relevant and is inspire action. That's the Police Center mission. And this is why we are organizing this webinar. Through our support for quality journalism, highlighting in essential and the reported issues, we aim at promoting discussion spaces that inspire action for positive change. Today, our topic will focus on managing marine resources for communities and climate. Throughout this session, we will explore how issues such as poorly regulated industries and lack of law enforcement play a role in the climate crisis and how we can imagine viable solutions to mitigate the consequences of climate crisis. With the Pulitzer Center stories at the heart of the conversations, we are bringing together journalists, leaders from environmental and social movements, policymakers and affected communities to create a space for critical conversations on marine governance, an essential pillar for the preservation of nations. From industrial fishing to overfishing via ocean ecosystems and the survival of coastal populations facing climate challenges, to their livelihoods, we will be exploring marine ma management issues and proposing alternatives and solutions to improve the sector. At, the, at a time when the role of the ocean is tackling climate change is increasingly at the center of the climate debates, it is important to discuss the rules governing the fishing industries and how it impacts the marine ecosystem and people's livelihoods. During this session, we will have the presentation from our speakers that I will have the honor to further introduce before they take the floor, followed by a Q&A session, and we will end with, uh, we will end sorry, this session with a closing remarks. Thank you again for joining us and kindly use the translation button at the bottom of the screen to select your preferred language and the Q&A to leave your question. Now let's hear from our panelists and the amazing work. Uh, they will be happy to answer your question and after all the presentation. Uh, now uh, let's welcome. Now let's welcome uh, Barry Christianson. Uh, he will be our first speaker this morning. Barry is a freelance documentary photographer and a journalist from Cape Town in South Africa. Um, he, he is a formal web developer. He, he used to work on diverse topics ranging from uh, his long-term projects on C.C. Gould House, a housing occupation in an abandoned state-owned hospital to seal death on South Africa's West Coast, and uh, what it takes to build a field hospital during the first wave of COVID-19. His work has appeared in a variety of South African and international publications, including the Daily Maverick, the Ground Up, and the Mail and Guardian, Nature, National Geographic, Global Citizen, Al Jazeera, rest of the world, among others. Uh, Barry is uh, a grantee from uh, the Police Center. Welcome, Barry, and uh, uh, kindly take the floor. Thank you, Afi. To share the screen. Mm. 
Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So thanks very much for having me on this panel. Um, I was privileged enough to have the Pulitzer Center fund uh, projects of mine, which started last year and ended <clears throat> this year. Um, what the project was about was going to um, photograph and report on coastal communities in each of South Africa's four coastal provinces to see what the pressures are that they're facing, especially in the face of climate change and South Africa's um, big push for um, oil and gas extraction. Through the photographs and the stories, I attempted to uh, explore the cultures, the communities, and the relationship of the people in those communities to the ocean um, in order to illustrate what's at stake and why they need to be supported and protected. Uh, the first place I went to was Dwesen Kloebe, which is in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. It's um, part of the coastline that's along the South Indian Ocean. Um, it's, a, it's made up of also communities that have fished there for the last 300 years. And during that time, they've suffered dispossession and forced removals um, during colonialism and then also apartheid. Uh, the, the challenges at the moment are climate change related, so adverse weather conditions and unpredictable weather, which makes fishing tricky. Uh, their fishing grounds are in the Dwesetwebe uh, conservation area. And one of the big challenges that they have is that the, the body that governs the conservation area seems to privilege tourism over their livelihoods. Uh, they've in the past, they've had to go through a court case to have the uh, customary rights validated and the courts ruled in their favor. But despite that, they still have an ongoing struggle in order to access the, the resources. In addition to that, um, their culture being the fact that they have resided there for over 300 years, their culture and religion are very tightly wound with the ocean and the rivers. And that spiritual relationship that they have to the ocean was actually used to stop Shell from doing seismic blasting in search of oil and gas off their coastline. Uh, the fisher in this photograph, David Gongos, he's, he was arrested for fishing in the Mbashi River, probably about 40 years after he first started fishing there. Um, and that led to this court case where ultimately their rights to fish in the area and their, their rights to the resource, to use the, the resources of the ocean and the forest were vindicated. But despite that, the ongoing struggles for to have a meaningful co-management of the reserve um, is still an ongoing one. And it's something that they they are still busy with today. Uh, further north, Cozy Bay, which is just on the border of South Africa and Mozambique, was another amazing place to, to visit. Um, in the photograph, a fisher is about to spear a fish in a fish trap um, called a fish kraal. And those fish kraals were, there's evidence that they were used at least 700 years ago in that same estuary. So the cultural and historic ties to that place are very deep as well. Because of the proximity to Mozambique, uh, they are feeling the impacts of climate change in, in quite a big way as well. Um, research has shown that as the ocean warms, cyclonic activity moves further towards the poles. And what um, you know, they, they might start to experience um, extreme weather events as that continues to happen and cyclones bypass Madagascar and make landfall closer to South Africa. Um, they also have 
issues with conservation, their privilege of tourism, tourism over their livelihoods. And it's also um, a battle that they are currently engaged in. Uh, they're supported with, by NGOs that um, work for fisher rights as well. And ultimately what they want is a recognition of their customary rights and also meaningful co-management of the nature reserve. Um, this uh, gentleman in the photograph, he's started to teach his son how to tend to the fish kraals in that 700 year old tradition. Um, and when asked why he's doing it, he says that uh, those fish kraals in the water are the only evidence that there were people there before. Then down to the Western Cape, straight by, um, it's also a small scale fishing or small commercial fishing village. Um, the lots of the fishes, such as the the man whose legs you see, uh, Martinez Newman, he uses a traditional boat called a chucky where they they steer with their feet. Um, the boats. They, they're basically 10-man boats, so they provide income for quite a few families in the community, but they are unwieldy and slow. And one of the big challenges that they find is that during the, the season where they tend to catch the most fish, they have to compete with recreational fishers. And the recreational fishing sector in South Africa is largely unregulated. So whereas they have the slow, unwieldy boats, um, the recreational guys tend to have quite high-powered, very fast boats. And because they go to the same sandbanks where the fisher are usually found, they can't compete with the recreational fishers. And even though they aren't allowed to sell their catches with recreational permits, they do so, which then further drives down the price that um, the commercial fishers such as Newman are able to get for their fish. Um, and pressures such as that impact on all the work in the value chain in Straits by. So this is his his wife and daughter work at the at the fish factory where they do quality assurance work. But obviously the, the fewer fish that comes in and the lower the prices that they're able to get, it has an impact on them as well. Um, Martinez Newman's daughter, M, she's basically um, standing for the portrait in front of her boat, and she wants to be the first woman skipper in Straits by. Well, the boat that her father fishes on was built by a grandfather who sailed it for some 600 kilometers to, to get to where they are. So there's, there's quite a strong uh, intergenerational character to that fishing community that also stands to be lost if, um, if anything, you know, if, if the pressures continue. The last stop was Wondekulapa in the Northern Cape. Um, it's situated on South Africa's West Coast. Uh, this photograph is from within the ruins of a fish factory that was built by the big commercial fishing fact fishing industry that was there a few decades ago. But um, after the 70s or so, they, they packed up and left. Um, situated in the mining areas where most of the mines have stopped being productive, Fishing is one of the only ways that people can make any income. But due to, again, due to climate change, fewer sea days because of adverse weather conditions have a massive impact on the ability to make ends meet. On days when there are lots of fish, uh, everyone in the community gets involved. Um, these these young men are cutting and cleaning fish uh, for a small fee. This year, while I was there, uh, there was a strange situation where there was some over-policing that was happening. Um, the, the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment didn't issue the fishes, their permits on time. And 
the fish that they target during that time was already plentiful. So police were there to to check their permits and many of them didn't have it as they were issued and their catches were confiscated, which was quite distressing for the community where many of the people are poor and depend on the catches and leftovers on days like that. And then this last photograph of Wonderclub Bay just symbolizes how the community sees their, their spots inside the fishing ecosystem. Uh, there are no lights, there's a gravel road, and in the distant horizon, there are three bright lights that either belong to commercial fishing boats who are allowed to fish at night or diamond prospecting boats. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Bahi, for uh, showing us what is actually happening there. It's uh, as we are, uh, as your story is about the community that we don't usually see in the media. Face, uh, uh, thanks so much for this uh, amazing photojournalism piece. And then let's go to our second uh, panelist. Please welcome uh, Dr. Aluba. Uh, Dr. Aluba is the Ocean Camping Leads for Greenpeace Africa, uh, which is a, a famous environmental uh, organization. Dr. Ba is based in Dakar in Senegal and has been working with Greenpeace since 2018. Uh, he leads uh, the Ocean Campaign in Africa and uh, his work involves advocating for the protection of oceans and supporting local communities in the effort to protect uh, the ocean through their activity. And uh, finally, he campaigns against the destruction of oceans through illegal fishing, fish meal industries, and other harmful practices. Thank you, Doctor, for accepting to be with us. Uh, please, the, sh the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Afi, and uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for this invitation. So I'm going to share my screen. So this presentation is about uh, uh, the fisheries manage mismanagement issue, but also like uh, the proliferation of fish meal and fish oil industry. So um, first up, uh, like uh, I'm going to give uh, the, the context of uh, the fisheries mainly in West Africa because the campaign is currently mainly focusing in West Africa. So as you know, it's uh, um, an area that is uh, very important in terms of bioecological uh, things. So uh, because of the upwelling that is an environmental situation that uh, that make the this environment very uh, uh, rich in terms of biodiversity, but in terms of uh, resources. So uh, this situation of uh, uh, um, uh, like uh, height, like uh, uh, resources make like uh, 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 this uh, area uh, very important in terms of socioeconomy because uh, if there is like fish, so there is a lot of job creation because uh, this area is a, 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 a coastal area. There is a lot of like uh, small scale fishing, so local uh, job creation. So there is also people that uh, uh, have their income around this activity. And it is also very important for food security because uh, most of the people that are in this coastal area have like uh, for the for the for the animal protein are using like uh, fish for for that and uh, uh, it's also very important in terms of cultural because it's something that is cultural for these like indigenous people if you can call them like that so this is like uh, an activity that is uh, very 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 important for people in this area so um uh, but uh, at this moment, there is a lot of threat uh, around this activity. So um, because of like uh, IUU fishing, so uh, like uh, there is at this moment a uh, uh, lot of distant water fleet, fleet that come from 
uh, Europe or Asia, so that sometimes are through like uh, fishing agreement and sometimes no. So there is like a lot of like uh, industrial vessels that are there competing like local fishermen. So this is at sea. And on the land, there is also what we call fish meal and fish oil industries. So it's some industries that are using uh, fish to produce uh, fish meal and fish oil to feed animals in Europe and Asia instead of like feeding like people on the on the, on on this this area. So it is a competition between a uh, uh, consumer African consumers and animals that are going to be like uh, feed in Europe. So that's very very unfair. So and uh, we also have a, a threat that is coming. So the offshore oil and gas. As you know, there is like this proliferation of this offshore oil and gas that is uh, uh, like all along like uh, West African coast. And we already see the example that already happened in Nigeria and we don't want that to be happen in West Africa. So at this moment, they are restricting the fishing area to communities. So and we also know that there is like high probability of pollution in this area also. And now the consequences are like uh, the fish, most of the fish stock are overexploited. We have uh, overcapacity, there is biodiversity loss, and there is a lot of risk of pollution. The At the socioeconomic level, like most of the fishermen are losing their job. The female fish processors also that are competing with this fish meal and fish oil also are losing their job. They lost their income. And the 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 west african countries mainly like mauritania gambia and senegal and like the others are like under food insecurity because now the fish there is a fish scarcity and even if you see the fish it's not accessible because of the price and uh, all these consequences also land to and what we call here illegal migration because now fishmen are using they bought like the small scale to use it to go to Europe directly for a better future. So that is something that is happening currently. Even yesterday, we found a boat with 40, around 40% 40 that dead inside. So there's a lot of people that, that lost their life like trying to go to Europe because of like the the fact that they cannot like do they uh, they cannot like have enough like fish at sea. So uh face to that. We are running like uh, campaigns, like uh, some campaigns to push uh, 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 authorities for policy change. As you can see, so we so just like uh, how we do it. So we do uh, like investigation, like around what is happening because we have a lot of means of investigation. We have ships. We can do sometimes ship tours. We can do investigation at sea, but also on land because we have some uh, 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 researcher that can do it for us. We can also involve uh, external researchers on, on universities or like a key person that can do it. So we uh, produce some report around uh, the issue. So when the one that is called a West of Fish or seasick report or find, finding a monster. And the last one that I did not mention here that we do uh, with feedback is called it like a uh, 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 blue empire. So, this like uh, uh, um, report focus on fisheries mismanagement and mainly uh, um, uh, uh, and mainly the fish meal and fish oil issue. So we also produce like uh, what we call a policy brief. So and also doing lobbying with authorities and MPs. So with this policy brief and with this report, we can like. Who's uh, like uh, share with the uh, authorities how uh, we can like change if we do a policy change to take like act and measure to stop this dynamic. So uh, uh, like uh, with communities also we work with with uh, with uh, authorities but also we mainly working with communities by doing capacity building by doing trainings like by doing also awareness raising. So regarding capacity building, what we are mainly doing is that like we share with communities what we call campaign tips. So we give them like capacity to be able 
to run their own campaign. So because, uh, you know, the organization are not like uh, here every time and every moment. So we give them capacity to be able to run their own campaign, even if Greenpeace or other civil society organizations are not here. And that works very well because there is like at this moment that we are, I'm talking with you, there is like uh, communities that create big coalition and now they are mem they are even able to go to, like to have like uh, to receive some funds from uh, funders to run like some campaign. So we also do what we call action or NVDA, nonviolent direct action. So uh, uh, this one one of the uh, example that I take is called oil stand because as you know with the fish meal and fish oil industries they 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 use like some tankers to to bring like uh, the fish oil from west africa to europe so we use one of our ship to block one of this uh, uh, oil tanker to just like uh, raise awareness around this issue in european uh, consumers but also in like international uh, uh, like plates so we do also what we call legal action because we train like communities to be able to feel like legal case against like uh, uh, environmental issue that they are facing. This one was about uh, one fish mill and fish oil factories that was that is uh, currently in the area that is called Kayar. And this fish mill and fish oil factories is owned by uh, uh, Barna, that is a, Span a Spanish one. So uh, they 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 well they they take like a lawyer prepare the strategy and all of that. So we do also what we call rapid responses because as you know the 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 borders like uh, the the EEZ of most of these countries are 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 something like open for IU. So there is some Chinese vessel that come there or Russian vessel that we identify and do like a rapid responses with communities. And we was able to push back 52 uh, 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 like Chinese vessel that was about to have licenses in Senegal and also a Russian vessel that come without license fishing there. And we do with uh, communities uh, rapid responses using the small boats doing like intensive campaign to push back. So, and we use also a uh, key dates to celebrate with the uh, communities like World, in World Oceans Day or World Fisheries Day. So this is like some example of uh, activity that we do with communities. One of them is the red mass protest that you can see here. So in the bridge, uh, we do like a uh, uh, protest against the fisheries management, uh, like uh, the government was about to give this 52 license. We do like a red mat protest. It was during uh, like time. Excuse me, Dr. Ba. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Ba, you have one minute left. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, yeah, this is like some kind of gathering that was done and you can see the, the ship here that was doing the, the, the action, stolen fish, stolen future. Like the woman also fish processor that was doing action to the ministry in charge of fisheries. So the impact is that like uh, uh, like of this campaign was like uh, national international media attention around like the active like uh, this fish meal fish oil issue but the fisheries mismanagement. So the the government finally organized the national consultation to freeze this uh, uh, fish meal and fish oil industries. In the Gambia also there is a yes there is a the government that promised do not increase the number of fish meal and fish oil factories. And like in Mauritania, there is even a decree to avoid the use of uh, fresh fish to produce fish meal and fish oil. And Barna, that was the owner of this uh, fish meal and fish oil industry, just sell its share, share its uh, sell its share in uh, and leave in uh, in like leave the the factory. So the population go to court. So yeah, now there is like uh, uh, like lot of civil society organization in. In West Africa, that 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 organized to 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 fight back themselves the 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 issue that they are facing. So maybe I can stop there. This is some example of engagement that was there with communities that do some protests, but also doing also a lot of media engagement around the 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 the, the environmental issues that they are they are facing. 
so yeah this is a, the case of the litigation so and uh, yeah and uh, over from here this is a board like an action at sea that was calling for the ratification of the world ocean treaty at this moment over and out thank you so much dr ba for uh, I highlighting how you are working on capacitating coastal communities and uh, what action they are uh, taking to demand uh, for their rights uh, thanks so much let's go to the to our third speaker, um, Shamim Wasi Nianda. Shamim um, uh, is a climate educationist, green warrior, humanitarian, enver environmental guardian, and activist. Uh, Mother Nature is her home, as she said, and she has a sense of belonging and attachment toward her. She believes in restoration and not extinction. Mount Kilimanjaro's fragile beauty is her source of inspiration toward environmental conservation. Shamim, please take the floor and take us through your presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Just to confirm quickly before I move on. Thank you. Um, so yes, yeah, we can um, hear you. Thank you. So I just want to quickly take us through of um, what we call managing marine resources uh, for communities and for climate. And as we know, um, we've been talking about climate change, the climate crisis, but then nobody is looking at how the climate crisis is also impacting our marine ecosystems, how the climate crisis is impacting our communities, and how what are the, uh, the key solutions that can be used to address these challenges that are facing our ocean ecosystem. And so... Um, it is through that that um, at the Tanzania Ocean Climate Innovation Hub, which I lead, um, I'm also a social scientist, uh, which I lead is we try as much hard as we can, as the name goes, ocean climate innovation. We are working with coastal communities in coming up with ocean climate solutions that can be used to leverage the marine ecosystems, but then at the same time protecting the same same systems that are you know contributing towards our livelihoods. For the, uh, for the coastal communities. And so, um, sorry. Yeah, and so um, the Tanzania Ocean Climate Innovation Hub is uh, it, it, it is a program a project endorsed by the UN Ocean Decade as part of the Global Ecosystem for Ocean Solutions Program under Ocean Visions. And here we are working at looking at what are some of the some of the key innovative solutions that we can come up with in terms of repair, how can we repair our oceans in terms of um, reaching, how can we reach our communities, how can we talk to them in terms of also trying to see um, how do we even restructure this in a sense that we are able to, to, cap to capture the carbon emissions that are being emitted within our ocean ecosystems. And that is part of us managing these ecosystems without necessarily understanding what is the technology that is available for us to be able to use to do that. What are the key solutions? What is the indigenous knowledge uh, available? And how can we leverage that knowledge for us to be able to articulate and speak about our marine ecosystems but also speak about the marine resources and not just um, all about taking, taking, because that is how it has been for years and centuries now that we've been just been taking from the ocean and taking, taking, but then we're not giving back. So how are we working with communities to make sure that we are also giving back to the ocean? We are also protecting the ocean. We are also working closely with the ocean and connecting the ocean to people. And um, I'm lucky that I also work with IOC UNESCO at, at their steering committee called on the ocean literacy, where we are trying to see how can we work closely with communities in order for us to be able to connect them to the ocean. Because sometimes it's so hard for me to protect something that I do not understand the essence of it, or I do not understand why should I even be protecting the ocean. And as we know, majority of the African countries, it's so difficult for us, if, if, even if we've grown up um, next to an ocean. Some of us even don't know how to swim. So how can we even be able to provide that kind of knowledge to these communities and provide them with the resources that are available in order for us to protect and manage our ecosystems, ocean or marine ecosystems? 
So then we looked at, uh, at the Tanzanian Ocean Climate Innovation Hub, we looked at uh, Tanzania's rich coastal resources and how it's facing the ocean crisis uh, due to the climate emergency that we are all discussing about. We are all talking about looking at ocean acidification. We are looking at the rising of temperatures. We're looking at biodiversity. We are looking at you know disruption of the ocean's balance. And and recently we had a research that talked about the the bleaching of corals for the first time in in, in East Africa, the Indian Ocean. So what exactly are we trying to do, and how are we working in order for us to make sure that we manage these resources in a more um, in a more sustainable way. How are we integrating traditional knowledge with scientific research? Because that is um, mo most of us fail in that direction to the essence that we believe science is the key solution to the ocean problems. But to, but to some extent, indigenous knowledge contributes a lot because these people have been there for years and ages, and they understand how the ocean ecosystems have been changing, and they can be able to also contribute towards that, but also looking at how do we even talk about the climate justice and equity part of it, particularly looking at the marine ecosystems. Um, the previous speaker, I think he talked about, you know, the distant water fishing nations and how they, you know, they come to our uh, our ocean ecosystems and then fish and then, you know, all those kind of things. But when we look at our own small scale fishers and sellers within our own countries, they do not have access to certain technologies that can allow them to go into deep waters or that can allow them to do distant fishing. So it becomes very hard for us to even talk about justice for us to even talk about the climate justice part of it within the ocean ecosystems, but also inclusive marine uh, resource governance. How do we talk about this? How do we empower local communities, including women and young people to take leadership roles in managing marine resources? And um, of course, this inclusive governance model will also ensure that the voices of all community members engaged in ocean and marine resource management are considered in ocean conservation and climate adaptation, focusing on the ocean climate crisis that we are experiencing. And of course, our, our, our main goal as the hub is to look at the, 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 to drive tangible ocean climate solutions through interdisciplinary efforts. And, and here we are looking at science, we are looking at technology, we are looking at business, we are looking at fostering sustainable development and climate resilience. And so how are we, how are we trying to bring all this together and you know, making sure that they are much understandable, they are much you know, taken in by the communities that are taking care of these resources? How are we creating the public awareness? And for us, we are doing that through ocean literacy programs. And, um, of course, it's through these programs that we are aiming at public awareness to the importance of marine resources and the role of ocean climate uh, in, in terms of um, in terms of regulation. How are we regulating the climate? Do we have the solutions? How are we encouraging innovation? Because for me, I believe it's through the innovative solutions that we, are, we will be able to at least solve some part of the problems that we are experiencing, especially in the ocean space, because it has been hard for us. That is why we say sometimes when we meet in the, into these ocean conferences, we're like, the ocean community is too small that everybody knows everybody. But then when you look at the, the climate change community through the UNFCCC, it's a very large community. And for me, I feel like it, it is high time that we as the ocean community also stepped up the game, stood out and said, you know, it has been enough and we need to stand up for our ocean. The ocean is always speaking to all of us every now and then. Whenever you hear those waves, that is a special sound that the ocean is communicating to you. So how are we trying to, you know, to also communicate back and, and you know, promise the ocean that we're going to protect our ocean, we're going to protect you, we're going to keep you safe. We are going to keep you from all these CO2 emissions and all those kind of things. And so um, it is through that that we are working on incubation and training programs where we provide incubation and training programs to blue startups specifically focusing on ocean climate, if, if, if be it technology, be it an SME, what are you exactly doing as a young person, uh, particularly in Tanzania, to make sure that you are focusing ocean climate solutions. And currently we, uh, we've been able to support one company called Sunwave Limited, which is supporting small scale fishers and sellers in the country by providing them with uh, solar powered ice machines in order for them to be able to preserve their catch so that they don't keep on going back to fish in the 
ocean simply because they couldn't find clients or customers for their previous patch. So that is what we are doing, but also working on scientific collaborations and testing. How are we doing research? How are we providing hands-on learning experiences with communities, with university students, and also trying to bring um, scientists closer to our coastal communities because our scientists have really, uh, there's, that, there's a very great uh, or rather bigger gap between scientists and coastal communities or indigenous communities. So we are trying as much hard as we can to see how can we be able to bring these people together for them to be able to work together in order for us to solve the problems or the, the climate crisis that we are experiencing. But then in the process, uh, we will be conserving and protecting our marine resources. Um, and, um, okay, my screen is not moving to the next slide. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. Can you see my next slide? No, but you can stop and reach, no, I think. but you can. You can see speaking and uh, meanwhile, you only have one. Yeah, minute, I think. Please. Yeah, I think I managed to. It was. I, I. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So our main agenda is we are really trying to focus in terms of protecting our marine resources. We are trying to look at what are the ocean-based energy production that can be, you know, can be innovated by communities, by young people, because we realize within the ocean space, majority of the young people, especially in East Africa, are so creative in terms of technology, but then they do not have access to resources, they do not have access to funding, they do not have access to everything that is needed for them to be as innovative as possible. But we're also doing regenerative aquaculture, where we, um, of course, we are doing seaweed farming, we are doing, um, we are doing seagrass, we are doing sea cucumber. For those who know sea cucumber, we are doing sea cucumber farming within or with our coastal communities. And that has really, uh, for the past two years that we have been working on this, is uh, we've realized that communities are really stepping up to protect our marine ecosystems because they understand it is contributing towards their livelihood. And so they're like, yeah, we need to protect these resources. We need to make sure mangroves are not cut down because that is where the, the sea cucumbers get accumulated and so it is through that that the people see the essence of why should i protect this ocean why should i protect the marine resources they see the value in it and and, and through that they are able to protect um these resources but also of course we are looking at um we are looking at advanced ocean technology where we are trying to see how can we also talk about ocean alkalinity um uh, enhancement tests within the indian ocean for example and how does that look like uh, in terms of marine resource management and how does that look like in terms of you know developing ocean based carbon capture and storage how does that look like within our communities and what does the science say about this itself and how do we implement this um all these things. So we, we, we are saying like at the Tanzania Ocean Climate Innovation Hub is uh, Tanzania should be part of the conversation. And not only Tanzania, but majority of the African countries should be part of this conversation to understand the potential and risks of technologies that are coming within our ocean ecosystem. For example, if you're talking about the ocean alkalinity enhancement, what are the, what are the risks? that come with it and how are we trying to address these risks and how are we trying to work together for us to be able to protect these ecosystems that we um we are really uh, working on with but also the need for marine carbon dioxide removal how does it look like what is the situation how how do we even talk about conservation how do you talk about resource management how are we make, going to make sure that our communities are also managing these resources in a way that is more beneficial to them, but also in a way that is contributing towards climate adaptation and resilience, particularly looking at the ocean ecosystem or within the ocean space. How are we enhancing coastal, uh, coastal ecosystems for climate mitigation? And uh, through that, we are actively engaged in ecosystem restoration projects, such as we're also doing mangrove restoration, and uh, of course, looking at uh, seagrass restoration, which, which is one of our projects that picked up like three months ago, and also trying to say that um, how do these ecosystems serve as carbon sinks and play a crucial role in you know being buffers of our coastal uh, areas for extreme weather events, but also looking at the rising of the water sea levels that we are all seeing and talking about this is due to the impacts of climate change, but also of course supporting our livelihoods uh, through what we are calling um, you know ocean farming. Here in Tanzania, we refer to it as ocean farming. How do we manage these resources within the ocean ecosystem? Of course, we're also doing mangrove beekeeping, the most 
expensive honey in the world and we have a community that is working on this project and it has been an amazing journey working on this with them and you know mangroves are not being cut down anymore because you know you cannot go and cut down a mangrove that has bees on it unless you, you have a death wish for yourself so that is how this ecosystem are, are really being managed and protected within the country in tanzania but also trying to look at uh, crab farming these communities are doing crab farming which is really interesting and amazing very accumulated within the mangrove and um of course trying to look at uh, of course the ocean literacy part of it, which we are really working with universities and communities to try and see as much as how can we be able to contribute towards, let's say, community-based uh, fisheries management, support for small-scale fishers, as I mentioned from the beginning. But also, lastly, I would like to say, um, as the, as the Tanzania Ocean Climate Innovation Hub, we are playing a very critical role, which I do think and believe and maybe say that it is all our responsibility, not just me as Shamim or as the leader of the Ocean Climate Innovation Hub, but also you as a person who is part of this webinar to be able to stand up and take that kind of responsibility in managing our marine resources for communities and climate by promoting sustainability, by looking at resilience, by looking at equity and innovation. And through these partnerships, of course, our communities are, are going to, we are going to promote community engagement and integration of traditional with scientific research, and this is going to drive a positive change in marine conservation and climate adaptation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, I mean, That was amazing to see how uh, you are uh, bringing this to the table, how you are empowering the community, and how you are um, actually using the uh, ocean as a source of energy and livelihood. Uh, hold, especially for young people. Thanks so much. Um, let's go to our fourth speaker, which is Professor Godwell Namu. Uh, Professor Godwell Namu, uh, he has a PhD uh, from Rhodes University. He's a full professor and ex chair in climate and sustainability transitions at the University of South Africa. Uh, he's also a National Research Foundation C1 rated researcher and subject specialist in the field of climate change, including loss and damage. Uh, also, sustainable development, coastal resilience and livelihood, as well as disaster risk reduction. Uh, Professor Namo is also a writer and he has published several books and uh, journal chapter. He has also participated in uh, the writing of chapters of uh, some books. Uh, is also one of the experts for the non-economic losses group under the UNFCCC Varsov International Mechanism on Loss and Damage. And his, he, he, current, he currently sits in the Hauteng Premier Climate Change Expert Group and is part of the Loss and Damage Forum for the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environmental and environment, sorry. Uh, welcome, Professor Namo, and the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, Program Facilitator. Please, can you confirm if you are seeing the presentation and hearing my voice? Yes, we can confirm both. Thank you. Um, I've been uh, requested by the organizers to talk about the decade action uh, number 42.5 which is basically global uh, cost of ocean restoration and resilience. We call it Restore Our Cost. And this is a UN decade endorsed uh, project um, uh, where we are going to be focusing on, on uh, several issues. I see my PowerPoint that back. Let me see, I can win. Okay, that's fine, moving now. These are some of the partners that are involved there, University of South Africa, Heroin, uh, IGP, uh, C, uh, CMCC, uh, Placon, and uh, uh, these are some of the partners that are implementing the uh, Restore Our Cost uh, program. Now, the countries and ocean basins uh, that we are working in are hereby listed, and I can't go through them uh, now because of time, but basically they, they, they are uh, from the North Atlantic Ocean, South Atlantic Ocean, South Pacific Ocean, Mediterranean Sea, and also others, including the Caribbean and also Walden Sea. 
Now, what is of interest really is to try maybe by focusing on what is happening on the on the global platform in terms of the ocean decade. So the ocean decade there is talking about a lot of other things that actually were presented in the earlier presentation. It's like uh, ocean literacy. It's about marine policy, oceans, and 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 uh, uh, coastal erosion. It's around co-design. It's around ocean governance, blue economy, uh, and I think th this actually speaks to even some of the uh, presentations on fisheries that came. The two presentations that came earlier on. The other issue that is interesting when we're talking about the how we build uh, ocean and, and coastal resilience, we talk about co-creation and co-production of knowledge and co-design and co-delivery of what you want to do. And uh, in Restore Our Coast, I'm saying it, this should be central in, uh, in, in our project that we're going to be doing. Now, in summary, what is Restore Our Coast all about? Restore Our Coast is, uh, um, it, it commenced on 1 May 2024 and it's going to end on 30 April 2030. And Restore Our Coast uh, addresses coastal restoration and resilience holi holistically by delivering new solutions for ecosystems restoration and, and management. This will be done through multidisciplinary approaches that in, integrates in situ observations, use of numerical models for forecasting, economic analysis, and also projected social impact. Now, the approach will inform the application of site-specific nature-based solutions, such as color reef reintroduction or restoration, seagrass and mangroves restoration, and also is around passive restoration measures, removing sources of disturbances, such as establishment of marine protected areas uh, will also be considered. I think what is interesting in terms of what I'm presenting and the past pre uh, previous presentation is this synergy in terms of what do we do to the oceans and the communities in terms of reintroducing um, uh, uh, nature-based solutions to, to address climate change and also to, to intervene in, term, in, in terms of what is happening there. Now, uh, as, I, as I highlighted the co-design and continuous stakeholder and user collaboration at pilot sites in more than 14 nations remains vital. So this, this is actually a global program that is seated um, across the world. And in these uh, 14 nations, where we are saying, we want to see then what's gonna happen in terms of addressing some of the challenges we are facing in our oceans, uh, some of the challenges we are facing in our, our, in our coastal communities. I've been posting some of the challenges the coastal communities are facing, especially uh, across um, the African uh, coastline. And I think these challenges are not by any way different from others that I face elsewhere. Now, it's also important to know that Restore Our Coast is also going to include private actors, government actors, and communities representatives. But why we are talking about community representatives, a lot of the work that is done, especially from academia, is 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 top down, and we are saying the the intention is good to try and assist these communities. But if these communities are not involved in such issues, then it's going to be difficult then to pr uh, provide solutions that are close to their hearts and solutions that they can find. And just a bit about climate resilience there or coastal resilience. You discover when you mention is around coastal resilience, climate change is, is, like going, is going to pop. And uh, there, there, are, there are matters that, that we need to look at. For example, sea level rise. We are also talking about maybe coastal erosion, sh uh, shoreline changes. We are talking about uh, issues around the uh, disaster management. Uh, we are talking about issues around the, uh, uh, hurricanes, tsunamis. We are talking about issues around uh, storm surges. So these, these, these matters are what the coastal communities are experiencing. And we are saying through Restore Our Coast and even other programs that are being showcased here, it's, it's important for us to, 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 to build then climate resilience and also alternative livelihoods. In the chat, I posted about the desire for us to talk about alternative livelihoods. Why alternative livelihoods? Because we are seeing that, for example, for the fisheries or fishing communities, there is a need, there is a need certainly to start talking about alternative livelihoods. What are some of those alternative livelihoods? I think one has already been mentioned around, maybe they could start uh, migrating to seagrass farming. Uh, they, that could be one of the 
interesting uh, areas they could also start now working on maybe inland aquaculture that's one of the areas maybe even migrating into also areas that are being promoted around the coastal tourism those are some of the areas but above all before we even start talking about these uh, alternative livelihoods there are challenges that the current communities are facing especially the fishing communities around access because we discover because many of them are subsistence farmers they don't even have money to buy a fishing boat and then they end up being just uh, uh, workers to companies that that are able to buy this and i say as we move forward and speak strongly about empowerment these are some of the issues that we need to look at it's not only about providing them with fishing gear we, uh, we like like protective clothing we need them to provide them with the actual uh, capital capitalization for boards and matters that matter in that particular industry we are also talking about in uh, restore cost the, the project size there for implementation uh, some of them we've got a renovate project uh, that is taking place in north of uh, Rome, Italy. We've got Mangoga project uh, um, in Keta, and that's also talking about in the east coast of Ghana. We've got Placon uh, test sites uh, that are taking place in, in Spain. We've also got the Mediterranean Blue Forest project with, his, uh, with pilot sites in Greece, Turkey, and Tanzania. We've got also projects on the coral reef restoration sites in Puerto Rico. Then we have got also uh, um, identifying new sites here in South Africa, for example, that we are going to be in terms of risk to our cost. Uh, for South Africa, we, we, we are looking at uh, Buffalo City Metropolitan Municipality, which is in the Eastern Cape, and that's the location there in the in the in in the map. So what I've done so far is UNISA, which is our leg for restore our, our cost in 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 South Africa. We we have started initiated a project a program called uh, a smart and resilient Buffalo City. So the reason why I'm calling it a smart and resilient Buffalo City is mainly to bring the new or uh, modern technologies in addressing uh, climate change, in building coastal resilience, and in early warning system, including also the issue about how do you deal with ice. So in the post, they, uh, somebody was talking about Senegal and how maybe uh, wastewater or sewer, uh, uh, sewer um, effluent is being channeled to the oceans and then destabilizes uh, fishing communities. And we are looking at a situation maybe where you need to close the loop in terms of wastewater treatment plants, moving towards net zero, introducing renewable energies, alternative energies, talking about biogas uh, generation, talking about even hydropower production, if, if it's a say, and automation of these wastewater treatment plants, which actually could be good lessons also for other coastal uh, uh, communities. And we are hoping that maybe, of course, it's a it's quite a huge capital uh, investment program, but we are hoping project, but we are hoping that once we can have a model of that kind of how you deal with net zero, what sort of treatment works, it's going to help not only South Africa, but other coastal communities on the continent and globally as well. So there are also issues that we are contributing in terms of SDG 14, Sustainable Development Goal number 14, which is mainly looking and also uh, as the other SDGs, in this case, the climate SDG is obvious, the partnership SDG is obvious, and also the uh, sustainable cities and communities is also another SDG in which Restore Our Coast is contributing. Now, in terms of uh, our concluding, the uh, conclusion we are saying, the Universal South Africa is a lead partner, uh, uh, looks forward to an exciting period of implementing this decade action, Restore Our Coast, and with its partners. And every effort will be made to enhance the growing partnership between and among the implementing partners. And lastly, the new sites for Restore Our Coast are being established, as identified, and with the hope of sharpening the focus on the decade action. I want then to say and encourage and thank the organizers for this webinar in terms of raising awareness, not only in terms of what is happening in the UN decade, but I think for me, this idea of building coastal resilience remains our fundamental priority across the world. The coastal community, there are people there, there are economies there, but with the changing climate, we see a lot of uh, coastal squeeze, a lot of pressure that is uh, getting into this community without alternative livelihoods. And I'm hoping that maybe as we move forward and also in this webinar series, we start caving our way into terms in terms of alternative livelihoods for our coastal communities. I thank you, organizers, and over to you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Namo, and uh, thank you for your message. I really hope it resonates with our participants and we will be inspired to take action and uh, to make it resonate to the uh, policymakers as well. So um, let's go finally to our last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Dr. Alana Malinde Lancaster. Uh, she is from Guyana and she's the former director of the Environmental Management Division of the Environmental Protection Agency of Guyana. Since joining the faculty of as a lecturer in international environmental and energy law, she has been actively involved in the environmental and energy law internationally and in the Caribbean region. She has recently been appointed as a member uh, of the executive team of the One Ocean Hub, a research collaboration with the University of Strasse Clyde. The UYI and 30 other research institutions in Africa, the UK and the South Pacific. Thank you, Dr. Lancaster for accepting to be with us uh, this morning. Please take the stage. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the kind invitation. I think uh, my uh, presentation will give uh, perhaps a global internet, uh, legal perspective uh, from the perspective, from the lens of um, human rights law and how it relates to many of the things that my, um, the presenters would have um, identified. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm, I, I was quite enjoying some of the presentation because some of it resonates directly with the work we, we, we have been doing at the One Ocean Hub. And also uh, some of the, in some, we have also been working in some of the communities, uh, at least uh, uh, when the first photo essay in, in South Africa, we've done some work in Cozy Bay, for example. All right, if I can get my presentation to move forward. All right, so uh, one of the critical um, aspects of, 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 of uh, the, the climate conundrum, and, and that, is, that is perhaps not as heavily recognized or, or emphasized uh, at an international level uh, is the relationship between uh, the, the, the ocean ocean and, and mitigation of climate change. Uh, generally, the link has been made with many terrestrial ecosystems as well as coastal ecosystems such as mangroves and seagrass beds, which are of course supremely important, but a combination of our blue carbon, which is our mangrove and co other coastal ecosystems as well as steel carbon, those intertidal ecosystems and the ocean, uh, we now know um, sequester uh, much more sign, much more uh, carbon dioxide than forest ecosystems. Uh, so the ocean is a fundamental um, resource in regulating climate va variability and sequestering carbon, what we um, have, uh, have termed the ocean climate nexus. But this is a, a critical gap. It, it remains a critical gap in international climate uh, discussions. And also, while it is an important resource in regulating the climate, it is also impacted negatively by the impacts of climate change, as well as the other uh, triple planetary crises of, of pollution and biodiversity loss, which many of my the previous presenters would have alluded to. However, uh, so we have on one hand this um, not full recognition, but increasingly we see at international law, several regimes uh, are increasingly recognizing the importance of the, the link between uh, oceans and climate change, including uh, the law of the sea, <laughs> um, international fisheries law, international biodiversity law, uh, and very importantly, international human rights law and uh, international children's rights law. Now, wh why is this connection between oceans and, uh, and climate change important? 
uh, it, it is critical, especially for global South states, including a, a group of what uh, of the most vulnerable states called small island developing states. Uh, these are states uh, located primarily across the Caribbean, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, but also have some members in Africa. And they, because of their inherent characteristics, they have been recognized by the UN since 1992 as being extremely vulnerable to climate change. But generally, the disconnect in ocean climate governance frameworks really, um, uh, for many of the reasons highlighted by the presenter from Tanzania, have direct and corresponding impacts on coastal communities. And, and this is even more so for, for SIDS. Uh, small island developing states. Also, if we look at as the ocean as a resource, um, and many of, 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 of global South states are former colonized states, um, their terrestrial environments are exhausted and 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 are you know basically over farmed and and so on. Um, the blue the, the, the marine environment under their control is is very fundamental to the blue economy. So in addition to fisheries, I've heard mention of um you know, mariculture uh, and so on. Some countries are pursuing oil and gas, which um, we have very strong views on, but there are, you know, there are many um, other aspects of, of the blue economy that are very important for states, including biotechnology, um, marine genetic resources and so on, which link directly to traditional knowledge. And if we look at it as a, 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 a as an a, a resource under the control of these states, it is crucial that we ensure that this resource is managed and protected and not threatened by climate change and other uh, planetary crises. Um, internationally, we've had a, the first strong statement on obligations or, or state obligations with respect to climate mitigation and, and the marine environment. Um, in the long-awaited advisory opinion by the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea in May 2024. Um, so what are some of the, the rights that coastal communities, um, as well as states, enjoy? And I've, I've just selected some, some rights to show that we critical to to transforming the role of communities and, and indeed vulnerable peoples in the marine and, and, and coastal environment from threats of climate change and other climate uh, planetary crisis. It is critical that we uh, we, we, we take a, a, a rights-based approach. And this um, rights-based approach at the, ocean, uh, at the ocean climate nexus is not new and in fact has been championed since 2007 by small island developing states as well as their collaborators and increasingly is being um, expressed in, 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 in international and regional courts. Uh, we've seen the Human Rights Committee um, express the importance of, of human rights, such as the right to life, uh, right to culture, intergenerational rights in, in, in the Torres Islanders case. Uh, we've seen that uh, the Human Rights Committee addressed the issue of climate migration in the Teota case, um, as well as um, in, supported by regional bodies such as the Inter-American Commission, Inter-American Court of Human Rights, as well as the International uh, Inter-American Court of Justice. And we hope to see a very strong expression from International Court of Justice um, in 2025. However, uh, and I don't have it bolded there, but I have to underscore that one of the most significant developments in shaping the seascape of rights uh, based on climate justice as well as human rights is the right to access healthy, um, safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, which the previous speaker highlighted through a series of actions under the ocean decade. Uh, but the right to a clean, healthy environment should be looked at um, it is it, it, it is includes a healthy ocean environment and it, it really underpins several key rights um, that communities and states should enjoy, including the right to life, the right to health, um, right to food and nutrition security, but also culturally appropriate food. Um, so uh, 
uh, many of the speakers spoke about you know rights and 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 practices spanning back hundreds of years um these are very important uh aspects of, of 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 people's culture and i think it was the first speaker who indicated that um the gentleman was was um teaching his son the practices because it was a a way of trans essentially transmitting knowledge from the past into the future um so this is uh a way of 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 ensuring the right to culture and spiritual rights, as well as the transmission of, of, of these rights to pass to, 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 to future generations and is very important for intergenerational equity. We also have important rights, such as the right to work and the right to education. Um, within the context of indigenous peoples, um, the, the discussion has also shifted to the right to self-determination within the context of climate change. And many states who face losing territory or 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 or, or the integrity of their territory are, are are looking at the relationship between sovereignty and climate change. Very importantly for communities are what what we call procedural human rights, the ability to access information, the ability for communities to participate and access justice in relation to. Uh, exerting their rights as well as using spaces and 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 being part of decision making within the marine environment. So very quickly, I won't go through all of these because I many of the speakers actually highlighted uh, in 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 their examples and in their discussion how at a national level states can implement some of these global level human rights into their own um, not practices, policies, and national legislation. Because in the main, many of the, the, the international agreements that underpin the ocean, the Law of the Sea Convention, um, that, that underpins climate change, the, um, the UN, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Paris Agreement, as well as on biodiversity, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, are subscribed by the preponderance of states, but the action there's there's there are challenges at the global level. But even when we agree to things at the global level, states often do not scale down these efforts or scale up efforts nationally, um, so that peoples, vulnerable peoples, communities can benefit uh, from uh, as these instruments are meant to. So, a key thing is introducing legislation policies and strategies that are are, are science based but I, I, I as i also have there not only science based and one of the previous speakers alluded to this but also takes into account not only uh traditional customary and indigenous rights but also uh promotes co-management and community based actions um including community based alternatives so for, for example in the caribbean um Sometimes a state may, in pursuance of its objectives under, for example, the, the Co Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, protect a marine area. So I work with a community in, in, in the Caribbean island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, called Myru, and they're pr primarily traditional fishers. Uh, the, the, the state, in an effort to protect a, a very pristine or almost pristine waters, declared an uh, entire no-take zone, which included their traditional fishing grounds, which obviously is not an optimal approach. Uh, one of the responses by the community was the in, well, was innovative in pivoting to um, seaweed mariculture, which allowed them to um, provide um, for their livelihoods and also had the additional benefit of 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 being of of um um providing for some of the fisheries which um they had lost because some of the fish came to spawn and some of the species, um but we have competing uses so sometimes we want we we're pursuing international objectives at the expense of communities and this is why co management and community based actions are so fundamental especially the recognition of traditional and customary rights. Um, the promotion of the marine spatial planning approach is critical. 
And I, I can give the examples from Barbados and Belize, which have pursued um, what we call death for nature swaps. So essentially, these are states with crippling um, debt uh, overhang. So have swapped some of their um, debt for in, in, in exchange for conservation action. So we've had Barbados, uh, Belize, the Seychelles, and I believe Mozambique, if I'm not mistaken, have pursued debt for nature swaps. And Barbados is in the process of pursuing a debt for climate swap. So these are beneficial because they both, um, this, the, the state writes off some of its sovereign debt, but it also, on the agreement that it pursues actions in line with um, biodiversity or climate goals. And one of the, the actions on this Barbados, for example, is taken is promoting the marine spatial planning approach, which is critical to balancing competing uses of the oceans and preventing um, coastal and blue grabs, which is, I mean, many of the speakers alluded to the competition between tourism and fisheries, between oil and gas and fisheries. And this is not only in Africa, this is also happening in the Caribbean, including Guyana, where I'm from. A critical aspect also is deepening the relationship between the gender dimensions of climate change. Um, as the climate um, issue um, deepens, uh, we need to um, recognize that it impacts different genders differently, as well as the cascading impact. So for example, in many traditional communities, um, their women do certain um, tasks, including trans transferring a lot of traditional knowledge to their children, including girls. And if, if, for example, if you have a forced migration between because of climate change, women are impacted differently. Women and girls are impacting differently. And globally, women are often marginalized um, from decision making and so on. And, and this has been recognized as a, 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 a area that needs to, to be um, bolstered. And, and as I have there, true mechanisms which provide, promote the principle 10 rights. So your principle 10 rights are your participation, access to justice and access to information. And this is especially critical for respecting the rights of environmental actors, including communities, um, women, indigenous, and in the region where I am from, Afro-descendant peoples, and very critically, youths and climate change. Um, in Africa, in the Caribbean, where I am, and globally, we are now in living in an era where the percentage of churn and youth are more than any other um, point in our history. And the climate, um, the climate issue will disproportionately impact them because essentially we are making decisions which they will have to live with. And often in many processes, they do not have a voice. Um, I, I, it, well, we are seeing heartening steps in, in this regard. Um, we've seen that, the, for example, recent decisions of the, um, of the climate cops have, have endorsed the inclusion of youth and children defenders. We have the recent, um, um, pack uh, this, uh, I'm not, uh, hopefully this will continue, but this is also supported by regional as well, uh, um, regional instruments such as the Escazoo Agreement and the Protocol of San Salvador in, 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 um, in Americas and the Aros Convention in the, in, in the European region. Uh, I, 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 I want to I, I, I want to perhaps end uh, because I think my time is short by underscoring the present the the, the words of of the, the presenter by uh, from Tanzania. One of the things that I always say because I I I was initially a a, a marine uh, not not a marine a environmental management and geography and then I went into law and yes while law. A legal framework, a law and policy framework is critical to effecting much of the change we, we need. A lot of this has to be done at the same time by promoting uh, a change in how we do things. And this is done through uh, literacy, ocean and climate literacy, promoting awareness and and getting people centralized in the process. And I, I, in many respects, this is a 
aspect that is downplayed in much of the discourse we are we, we are having. And often when you you know you have a project that that tries to that that, that is focused on marine or, or oceans or, or or climate actions, uh often climate and ocean literacy is sidelined or, or or diminished. And I view this as a critical component, including the overall and long-term success of many of these strategies we um we we uh we we need to embark on so to me ocean and climate literacy especially of children and youth both in informal and formal mechanisms through our schools youth clubs um through this, the media social media included is critical while we are pursuing a lot of these global and national frameworks um such as you know including promote preventing marine pro pro pollution ensuring a fair and just trans transformation um transform excuse me dr alana yeah i'm, I'm excuse me up. excuse me yes thank and, you and 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 looking at the impacts of iuu fishing so we need to to recognize that um you know we we, we need to, to come at it as a, a, a as a comprehensive approach uh, i thank you and um I, I welcome any questions or comments you may have Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Lancaster. This is so amazing. And thank you uh, as well for uh, 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 pinning the fact that uh, uh, ocean and climate literacy is so, so important uh, for communities and uh, 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 literacy through media, schools, university. Um, I think that is why actually we are uh, doing at the police center this um, uh, uh, engagement program. Uh, is, it is about uh, to be able to build a community that is able to uh, take actions, to advocate, and uh, also uh, uh, to bring change in our uh, society. Um, thank you so much. We we have now reached uh, the uh, the part where we are uh, uh, asking questions to our panelists. Uh, we have uh, our first question, which is: uh, Can you please tell us? Um, this is a question for all the speakers. Uh, briefly, uh, what do you think ocean resilience uh, can do in an era of climate change uh, in five years of time? So I can repeat the question in another way. What does ocean resilience in an era of climate change look like in five years of time? from your experience, of course. So who would like to speak first? I can go. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you, Shani. Yeah. And um, maybe I'll try to also switch on off my video so that uh, yeah you can I don't mess up with it. We can see you. Okay, perfect. No, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you. So uh, for me, ocean uh, ocean resilience uh, to me it's uh, you know it it really refers to in a way that how are we capacitating our own oceans to recover from stress but also to look at the adaptation part of it, as I mentioned from the beginning, like how do we maintain its ecological um, functions despite the disturbances that have been going on, despite the, the climate change itself, the pollution, the overfishing, the habitat destruction. So to me, that is how um, 
it looks like. And of course, it includes, uh, it has different key elements that we can be able to look at and be, be say like in the next five or 10 years, or let's say vision 2030 and beyond for our ocean ecosystems is to look at how they, the health marine ecosystems, how do they look like? And if, if it's the corals, how do they look like mangroves, seagrass, seabeds, seabeds and everything? How does that really apply and how is it adapting and how are the communities also adapting? For me, that is resilience, but also looking at the biodiversity, the um, the marine protected areas, the, ad the adaptable fisheries, how is this industry working? And also looking at green and regulated waters because we have, um, <clears throat> sorry, we have to look at uh, innovation in a way that it addresses the problems that are going to face us not only now but in 10 years to come in 50 years to come and that that alone is the resilience part of it so what are some of the key innovative solutions that we are coming up with that we know are not only going to solve the problems of today but are also to going to make sure that our communities are resilient and our communities can only be resilient only if they have or health oceans, because that is their right. And our communities can be resilient if they have access to these marine resources. And our marine resources can also be resilient if they are being protected, if they are being managed um, in a more um, sustainable way. So sustainability is key, but also looking at the policies themselves. How do policies also talk about the resilience of the marine resources, but also of the communities that are, you know, next to these resources and looking at uh, the climate change mitigation? How does it look like for our countries? How does it look like for the global south? Ocean literacy, do people understand? So we are looking at the resilience where people are able to understand all these structures and integrate them in a way that they can have, you know, key solutions to the problems that are really facing in our ocean ecosystems, but them as well, especially with the coastal and indigenous communities. Thank you. I can Thank come you in so there. much. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you, facilitator. Um, thank you uh, uh, for the response that was given there by Shamim. Um, I just want to maybe um, disintegrate it a bit or maybe distill it a bit to say when you're talking about ocean resilience, we are saying, are the oceans and our seas able to bounce back? Bounce back to where? Bounce back to their original status, where everything being equal, there was no marine pollution. There were no plastics coming to the ocean. There was no um, seabed mining. There was no oil spills. They, 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 they. So, so, so that, that's one aspect. So the one aspect is global. So when you talk about maybe the climate change, uh, the, the the emission of the greenhouse gases, the harmful greenhouse gases or carbon emissions, that's more at a low, at a global need of address. But there's also is around the local communities. What we do as municipalities, um, discharging uh, raw sewage at times, discharging uh, substandard effluent into the ocean at times. So that also has got a part that 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 we play at a local level. When the mangroves are getting destroyed, this is actually activities that are taking place at a local level. So building ocean resilience requires or demands us to address the global arm which is mainly on the emissions of the greenhouse gas, gases. So we need then to see uh, the key emitters, the major emitters coming to the party to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is actually addressed under the Paris Agreement. Then when we also start to talk about now building resilience, not only of the oceans and the communities, which is coming also under the Sendai framework, we need a lot of local action and national policies. So what you discover, you go to Mombasa, then you see maybe raw sewage is coming to the ocean, and you go maybe to 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 other 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 cities in in East Africa or West Africa or Southern Africa that are coastal, and the laws, the national laws are different. So one of the major issues that we are challenging with now is the laws across the, the jurisdictions are different. So we also need them to start talking about harmonizing our laws so that we are they speak to one ocean. We don't have many oceans. We've got one ocean, by the way. So I'm simply saying the national laws also need to be harmonized so that we know what we are trying to address. We're not talking about effluent discharge. Is it the same standard in Mozambique? Is it the same standard in South Africa? Is it the same standard in, in, in Namibia? Is it the same, same standard in Barbados or US or Canada? So these are actually some of the challenges we are facing, whereby we say we need our national laws to speak 
to the same language. I know there is the Indian Ocean Rim group and i also know that there is the all atlantic ocean research group or association so i think they are thinking in these realms we now need to start talking seriously about how we speak about ocean uh, regeneration or ocean resilience but we also need to accept that some oceans they could have gone beyond the ability to 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 rebound to bounce back so then we are saying then how do we deal with the dead oceans because like they 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 there maybe there are certain parts of the oceans that could be dead now because of what we have thrown into the ocean and then as humanity we now need to start saying what do we do about this type of oceans that, that might not be able to bounce back to their original state. Thank you and over. Thank you so much. Uh, before taking uh, another speaker, I would like just to uh, say that uh, we are a little bit of a time. Uh, we will stop in nine minutes, uh, but uh, please, uh, we will share with you the link to the, uh, the uh, survey post events. Uh, kindly go to the link uh, to um, answer the few questions we have for you. Um, if we don't have another uh, an answer from another speaker, we can go to another question uh, from the Q and A uh, box. Um, we have a question, which is: Are there central based research that brings students from different countries in Africa in order to create better awareness? Are there central based uh, research that brings to students from different countries in Africa in order to create better awareness? Um, maybe Shamin or Dr. Ba can answer, even Professor Na uh, Namo. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I would say uh, from, from my experience and my perspective is within the ocean space, I would say no. But uh, currently what is happening is we are really trying to see how can we create such programs for young people. And, um, and, and, and of course, now we are looking at, uh, we have this university in, in, in Kenya called the uh, Mombasa Technical, Un Technical University of Mombasa, but also looking at the University of Dar es Salaam and how can we work together in order for us to bring different students across Africa for them to be able to explore the possibilities of ocean research. Because when you look at it, majority of the African young people do not want to venture, for instance, into ocean science. They feel like this is something that is not just meant for them. It needs a lot of work. It needs a lot of research. So we are really trying to work on such programs that are going to be able to um, to bring them together, to work on research, to work on data collection, to work on different activities, but also to engage in ocean literacy, but also trying to see what are some of the expertise that these young people have that they can be able to leverage, particularly looking at the, the, the African continent, because we are talking about in terms of ocean conservation and ocean resources in Africa. Africa is really underinvested, but also young people are really over mentored, but then they're also underinvested. So how can we invest in young people and, and at the same time also mentoring them and empowering them to continue engaging into ocean climate related activities, but also generally into the marine ecosystems and do not be able to provide proven research and data to be able to work through all those spaces. So I can say it's something that is on, on the pilot and it's going to come up soon. And I think you should be one of the people that can be able to join that program. Thank you very much. Back to you, Afi. Thank you for sharing, Shamim. That's good to know. Yes, I can also come in there to say at, at the University of South Africa, we are busy trying to pitch a research chair that is looking at women and youth in marine and coastal spaces. So we hope maybe that can come through and then we can maybe start talking about those exchanges in terms of the young people. I believe that young people have got solutions that we need for tomorrow. I'm also trying to answer the question that came from uh, um, Arik, Arik, Arik Babu uh, there in the chat uh, from Niger Delta. So there, there, there are solutions there that we can get from the young people. But I also want to talk about what we call maladaptation. So maladaptation, answering Eric Babu's question, is when a solution that we pitch, for example, you might want to 
to build uh, flood defenses uh, to coastal communities. But in the process, we discovered the flood defenses, they then act as ponds or dam, dam walls. Then they flood, the, so if there's overtop, then they end up flooding the side where the communities are, where that uh, intervention was supposed to be protecting the flooding. So there's also what we call maladaptation. And we're trying to say we need also to avoid maladaptation if you're talking about building coastal resilience. It's not only that, there's also a number of examples that we that can consider maladaptation. For example, you bring a, a species, uh, maybe <clears throat> you're doing mangrove restoration, you, you bring maybe a hybrid mangrove uh, 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 a product that can cause other, other issues that you don't intend. I will conclude there by giving you one of the examples that came, that comes from Kenya, where one of the sorghum uh, uh, cultivar that was introduced uh, uh, ended up attracting a lot of birds, and it was actually eaten up before it matured. It was too sweet, and the birds really liked it to an uh, to an extent that it could not progress to maturity because it was actually sucked by birds because of that cultivar. And, and the sweetness that you have. So that becomes a maladaptation uh, measure. So we are going to be dealing a lot with the situations of maladaptation in terms of ocean governance, spatial, uh, ocean spatial planning and other, other matters. But I think we need to be on the lookout. It does not stop us from providing uh, these solutions. Thank you and over, facilitator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor um, Namo. I have one question for uh, Barry Christianson. Uh, um, your work as a journalist uh, inspired us this uh, specific webinar because we wanted to see uh, how good or bad governance can impact uh, climate uh, and uh, the communities. From your perspective as a journalist, how do you see people uh, being involved in uh, the governance of uh, uh, marine spaces, ocean, sea, um, in the future? Um, that's a good question, Afi. Um, I mean, in South Africa, it's, it is quite tricky because at least two of the communities, um, so Dresden Plebe and Cozy Bay, that I visited are actively trying to be involved in the management of the marine resources in their areas. Um, and they're just not being allowed at the table. So my, the photo essay focused on small scale fishing villages where people, they don't subsist per se, but they, they catch far fewer fish, far less fish than commercial fishers, but they do sell part of their catch. And for them, they weren't really recognized as a sector when we got democracy and the Marine Living Resources Act was promulgated. So they actually had to go to court to be recognized as a sector. And since their recognition, they've been marginalized all along the way. Um, so in an ideal situation, those communities like the Dresa Tweve, where the courts have um, validated their customary rights, it's just not been realized in practice, they would have an actual effective co-management situation with uh, with the marine protected area that they fish in. And the same goes for Isimangaliso. And then just in terms of the small scale fishes and the impacts, they um the impacts on fish stocks are, are far fewer than that of the commercial and industrial fishers because they, they use smaller boats. There are fewer of them that are allowed to go out and fish. So I think on the other hand, giving them a more equitable um, slice of the pie would also see to a lot of um, a lot of the issues that we are seeing in terms of just dwindling resources in terms of let's say West Coast rock lobster or certain fish species um, being less under less pressure, you know. I don't know if that answers what you what you asked. Thank you so much, Barry. Uh, I have a specific question from the participants for uh, Dr. Ba, and the question is: uh, 
is the is pollution due to the increased urbanization and the lack of wastewater treatment and industrial waste uh, the new harbor project the planned desalination plants also a factor impacting fisheries uh yeah thank you very much uh Afi and neil for this question so yeah i think there is an uh, uh yes there is a really an uh, like it's a threat also on fisheries like as you know in the and bay that is here is very very polluted and if you know that look at the food chain it's clear that it's something that is impacting fisheries but also impacted like even people that are consuming fish some fish that come from this area so it's a real impact that uh, like uh, people uh, like uh, some of the communities are are facing and some of them also are fighting back and also give like solution to communities at this moment there is some initiative regarding the domestic pollution but uh, the, the 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 one that uh, at this moment we are uh, uh facing really is the new harbor that are that they are, they are that they are putting but also like uh, uh the desaline like the salinization like the desalinization water and this is that they are putting uh hopefully one of them is cancelled and we are trying to push that like uh, it like do not continue because it's going to increase the salinity as you know fish is uh, something that uh, have an ideal of uh, temperature and salinity. If it change, the fish go uh, like in another places. So that is not good for fishmen that are here. So yeah, indeed, like uh, yeah, um, Neil, that's that's clear that it's is an impact. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor Ba. Uh, thank you so much uh, to all the speakers. Uh, Barry Christianson, Professor Godwin Namo, uh, Shami Mwasi, and Dr. Alana Lancaster for uh, actively participating and sharing with us your knowledge, your work. That is a great inspiration. Um, uh, uh, Jesse, uh, the reaction during your presentation, it was amazing. A really educational session and it's full of inspiration for us to uh, acts uh, now, even in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, we are uh, in the end uh, of our webinar session. Unfortunately, we have uh, to stop here. Uh, thank you, dear participants, for joining us, for making this session really, really engaging. Uh, thank you for your question. The rest of the question, we send them to the speakers so they will um, answer and uh, 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 we will uh, find a way to uh, reach the, the uh, answers to you uh, through our newsletters or our communication channels at the Pulitzer Center. Uh, this is just a first uh, session of this interconnected webinar series in 2024. Please, I invite you to stay tuned and to uh, uh, actively participate to the next one, we will be focused on uh, this uh, theme, uh, to hold to work, progress and challenges in hate legislation for worker protection. It will be held on October 4 uh, at uh, 7.30 p.m. Jakarta time, which uh, corresponds to GMT plus seven. And this session will, will examine the advancement and ongoing challenges in developing heat protection policies and workers. We discuss the current state of legislation and the necessary steps to ensure worker safety in increasingly hot climates. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, we are wrapping up this session. Thank you, dear participants. Thank you, uh, our dear speakers, and also thank you, thanks to the police team. Uh, uh, see you in our next session. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. -bye.